Kristen Wyndham. I'm a registered and licensed dietitian and work in the Butyl Health Center on campus. So my main role is seeing students as patients for any type of nutrition need, um, but I'm happy to partner with Wellness Works to do these wellness presentations. For those of you who weren't here last week, we talked a lot about how to meal prep and what to put on our grocery list and what that looks like. So today we're really going to dive into a virtual grocery store shopping experience. Um, as I was thinking about that walking over with the beautiful weather, I thought, you know, most people, a lot of people don't even step in the grocery store anymore. Um, how many of you really utilize the curbside pickup, that type of thing? Okay, awesome. How many of you are in the store regularly? Great, awesome. Um, so it's a little bit different than what most people are the new trend coming out. I'm one of those two. I like to go in there, look around, find what I need. Um, so hopefully you'll find that this is going to be really helpful for what to look for, what, what's marketing, what's not, and how to sort through some of that. Um, this is a very informal presentation as well, so please feel free to ask questions as we go throughout. I'm going to try to go through it fairly quickly, so we'll save time for questions at the end, um, especially for our Zoom participants to type in any questions you might have, so we can address those as well but I wanna make sure that you're getting the most out of this as well, okay? So let's go through this here. Let me make sure. Okay, I think we're good now. All right, um, so our objectives here, we're briefly gonna just talk a little bit about what that list looks like. We talked a lot about that last week, but we're gonna go over that briefly. Um, how to navigate the grocery store, and then we're gonna dive into each section of the store. One of the things I really love about my job that I get to do is to take students on a grocery store tour. So we have a grocery store tour program that students sign up and we, we take them around. It's really eye opening for them because it's, it's amazing to see what we're buying and why we're buying what we're buying. So really at the end of the presentation, I just want you to be a smart consumer. If you keep buying the same foods you're buying, that's great. If you're making different choices because of what you've learned, that's wonderful but know why we're getting what we're getting and don't get sucked into some of the marketing and um, just the way that the store is laid out of why we're choosing what we're choosing. Okay. Um, we briefly talked about this last time as well, but I'm just going to throw this up here to reiterate what a plate should look like. So when we are making meals and when we are putting these things together, we want half of our plate fruits and vegetables. We want a fourth of it to be whole grains. What does that mean? It's made with more protein, a little bit more fiber, and we're gonna dive into that again today. And then a fourth of it being pro, uh, protein with three servings of dairy per day, and you'll see that glass of milk or yogurt or cheese on this plate. This is really ideal of what we wanna focus on to make our meals healthy and balanced. Doesn't always happen that way, but this is really the goal and the emphasis when we are shopping. Um, I put this up here because the nutrition facts panel is really confusing for a lot of consumers. And I'll tell you, even as a dietitian, sometimes I can start buying things and I buy things because that's what mom always bought, or that's what roommates bought, or that's what kids like. And we don't really start to take a look at really what's behind it. So my biggest challenge for you today is to start flipping the package over. Look at the label instead of all the marketing and jazz on the front. Because while that's great and enticing to purchase that, what's really behind it is in this nutrition facts panel. So some quick tips here without going through the whole pack, um, panel and having you try to figure out what this is. What I always tell my patients is when you're looking at a label and you're kind of confused with grams and milligrams and I don't know how much that is and how much do I need, um, how much protein is too much, how much sugar is too much, just scan to the right hand side and you're gonna see those percentages. That's a percent of our daily value. So it means how much on average do we need? Well, we need 100% of this per day. This is X number percent of that. So if it says here 17% um, total fat, if we need 100% in a day or less, depending on your calorie needs, that's what's gonna indicate if that product is a good amount of that, low, high, what that may be. So a really good rule of thumb is if that percent is around 20%, I would say 17, 18, 20 higher, it means it's high in whatever that's next to. So this would be fairly high in fat. Um, this would also be a little bit medium in our dietary fiber. So that's 12. 5% or less means low in. Okay, so that means it is a low sodium product, 95 milligrams, and you're going, okay, how much is 95 milligrams? We don't measure in that, so it's really hard to see that. But if it says 4%, 4 
great, that's a lower sodium product. And if I need lower sodium in my diet, then this is good for me, okay? So this is just a really quick and easy way to look at labels right now. Um, we can certainly go further into this. I just don't wanna spend a ton of time, but I'll, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have on this. Um, but this really gives us an indication for what we're looking for, okay? Also keep in mind, below the nutrition facts panel, there's gonna be an ingredient list or somewhere on the label on the back. The ingredients go from most prominent in that product to least prominent, okay? So if you're questioning, okay, well, is, is there a lot of sugar in this? It says um, 18 grams, but I'm not really sure. It, it doesn't really say here. Well, if sugar is one of the first one or two or three ingredients, it's probably pretty high in sugar. So those are just some things to keep in mind when we're looking at labels. Okay, um, when we go to the grocery store too, we wanna always start with the list. I always say trying to plan your meals around the foods you have. We talked a lot about that last time. Um, stock with the basics, so go with those items that are pretty non-perishable, things that are gonna be easy to, to work around. Um, don't go when you're hungry. Try not to go with a whole lot of people and kids because they tend to throw different things in the cart as well. Um, so really try to think about having that plan in place before we go. Um, for those of you who weren't here on the last presentation on Tuesday, in the previous presentation's link, um, there's several different resources for grocery store um, templates of how to line out your food for grains and proteins and that type of thing if you want those. Um, those are all available for you. And then when we think about the store, I always tell my patients this too, the, the store is a business, right? So they're going to try to market different things in different ways. And if you notice, the eggs and the meats and usually the dairy is always far in the back. One, that's where a lot of the refrigeration is. But two, we have to go through all of that to get that gallon of milk that we really just needed. But in the meantime, we picked up this and this and this to get there. So think about that strategic approach to how I'm gonna shop, having the list in place to do those things, okay? Um, so let's first start about breads, grains, pasta. Tell me some things here of things you look for in these sections or maybe some questions that you might have when you're looking for the grains. So bread, pasta, rice, grains, anything like that. Any marketing buzzwords that you may see or things on the outside of the, the labels that are confusing? Okay, so she mentioned she likes to look for the 12 grain bread. So let's talk a little bit about what does that mean and what should we be purchasing here, okay? Um, so before we go into that, because we have different types of grains, what do you think about this? White grain is just as healthy as whole grain bread. True or false? False. How many of you say false? Okay, how many of you say it's true? Right, good. So yes, that is false. Um, and the reason for that, I kind of mentioned already, our whole grains compared to our white grains, you're gonna see the comparison here, have a little bit more protein and a little bit more fiber. Those two things help keep us fuller longer. It helps with weight management. It helps with satiety and feeling fuller. So those are what we're looking for there. But in the bread section or grain section, there's a lot of different breads. It's not just white bread and wheat bread anymore. There's 12 grain, there's multi-grain, there's honey oat, there's honey wheat. So what do we look for? There's white wheat, there's all kinds of things. So what do we look for? <clears throat> we want our whole grain breads. So an easy way for me to explain this is whole grains are a big umbrella that there's diff different types of grains that are whole, okay? Oats are a whole grain. Quinoa is a whole grain. Wheat flour is a whole grain. Brown rice is a whole grain. It means that the grain is stayed intact. So there's an outside and inside of the grain. Um, an easy way to think about this too is a sunflower seed. There's the shell in the inside, all right? When we make bread, that grain stays intact, that shell is used, the seed is used, everything is used. When we make white bread, the outside is stripped, the inside seed is used, but the fiber and protein have gone away. So it's not that white bread is terrible, it's just lacking in more nutrients from what we get. But whole grains are the big umbrella and then we can have wheat under that, we can have oats under that and so forth. But what we really wanna look for is the fiber. And we also wanna know that um, a lot of these products may be listed as just made with whole grain. So the key term here is 100% whole grain or 100% whole wheat. 
that means it's made with 100% of that grain or of that wheat, okay? Um, so these lists here, when we see whole grain, whole wheat, um, brown rice, we see rice cakes, those are all great choices. When we see some of these here on the right, you may see um, muffins and they say made with whole grain and you're thinking, great, that's what I wanna choose. But remember when I said we gotta look at the ingredient list? The first ingredient may or may not be whole wheat flour. It may be enriched, unbleached wheat flour and that means white flour, okay? So it can be a blend of the two. What our whole grain means without the 100%, it just means it's made with whole grain. So there's gonna be wheat flour in it. There's gonna be maybe oats in it. There may be some brown rice in it, but it's not made with 100% of that, means it's made with maybe some white flour or white products as well, okay? That just means it's blended together. So fiber's still gonna be there, protein's still gonna be there, but we're not gonna get the better benefit of having all the protein and all the fiber in there, okay? Um, so this kind of reiterates what is a whole grain. I've mentioned that already. How much should we eat? They really recommend here at least three servings per day of that. Um, last week, I talked about making half of our grains whole. For those of you who may not really like whole grains or brown rice isn't the same texture as our white rice or it's just not the same flavor, um, I would encourage you to make a, a pan or a pot of brown rice, a pan of white rice, and then blend the two together. That's a great way to help make it somewhat whole grain. Um, it's okay to buy just whole grain bread that's not 100% whole grain. Just know we're not getting that extra protein and extra fiber in there. Really how I see it just from a nutrition standpoint is 100% whole wheat or 100% whole grain is the best. Then we go to things like maybe multi-grain. We think about what that means. That means many grains. So we're gonna have maybe some white grains, some whole grains, mixture of both. You may have honey oat in there. You may have um, honey wheat in there. So there's wheat in the name, but it's not 100% whole wheat. Okay, and then we go to white bread, still a decent choice, but we're not getting the better benefit from the top. Does that all make sense? Okay. Questions about our grains? All right, yes. Yes, excellent question. So what about gluten-free? So let me just talk about what gluten means and then we'll get the nutrition benefit there, okay? So what gluten is, it's a, it's a nice buzzword right now. We see it on the outside of packages. We see it in health sections. We see it in recipes online. I mean, so it can be really confusing. And this is where shopping in the stores really becomes confusing for a lot of consumers because it's like, what do I buy? Is that better? Is that not? So gluten is a protein found in wheat, rye, and barley. Okay, so we talked about wheat being good. It's whole grain. It's good for us for protein and fiber. Um, rye and barley also have gluten in it, okay? Some people are sensitive to it, so they just don't break it down as well, and it hurts the stomach a little bit, and we have what we term gluten sensitivity. And then we also have a medical condition called celiac disease, which is a complete intolerance to gluten. We have a lot of gastrointestinal issues with that, and those patients need to avoid gluten completely. That's why gluten-free food started in the first place for that patient population, and lucky for them, it's a new trend, so they have a lot more variety to choose from, but people are jumping on board thinking it's healthier. And in reality, it's not healthier. They're usually using alternative flours or um, starchy type products. Maybe they're using a potato starch or a rice starch, or maybe they're using um, an almond flour or peanut flour. And while those are fine alternatives, you're still getting a great benefit from wheat and whole grain products. Um, where people, you may see, okay, I lost a little bit of weight going on a gluten-free diet. Usually they're just cutting out a little bit more processed foods in their diet. They're not changing so much in the way that they're eating or choosing to, to change their lifestyle. It's just they're not eating as much of the, the carbohydrate in that regard. So it's not healthier for the person who just is fine tolerating gluten, and you would know if you couldn't tolerate it usually by now. Okay, good question though. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so for those that need the, the gluten-free recommendations, it was asked about celiac disease or just a gluten sensitivity. Certainly, I always recommend things like quinoa, which is naturally gluten-free. 
your brown rice is naturally gluten-free, um, your um, oats, some people will, will give you different perspectives on that. As long as the oats weren't manufactured in a gluten-containing facility, you would be fine with that as well. Um, and brown rice is perfect too. Potatoes, those are all great grains and starchy components that you could use instead of gluten. So there's a lot of options out there. Um, really where we get a lot more of our gluten is in those processed foods. Okay, yes ma'am. Yeah, I sure can, yes. Um, so the, the question was what brand of bread? And let me just give, I'll give a little bit of an overview on brands right now, maybe this will help. Um, so when we think about shopping, we're not gonna dive into a lot of budget friendly right now, but a question I get from a lot of consumers is, well, how do you know to buy store brand, name brand, which one to choose? So my recommendation is if it's just a basic commodity group, so bread, eggs, milk, meats, cheese, things that aren't really processed. It is what it is. The egg comes from the chicken. The bread is made with the grain. Um, your store brand products of that are exactly the same as the name brand. Usually the name brand is just um, a higher grade. So for example, if Sanderson Farms makes, produces the chicken and through processing it broke its wing, HEB says, well, I'll buy that and I'll cut that up into chicken breasts and legs and thighs and sell it. But Sanderson says, I'm not going to sell that because it has a broken wing. So it's coming from the same area. They're just purchasing maybe the downgraded version. Nutritionally, perfectly fine. Um, food safety, perfectly fine. It's just a little bit different. Um, so bread, for example, a lot of times I'll buy the HEB branded 100% whole grain bread. Now there are other specialty breads. So from the bakery, you may like that type of flavor and texture. You may like the Sarah Lee bread because it's a little bit has different oats in it and that's fine too um, but it's with your basic products buying store brand is fine when you're buying more things like um, I think about chips or things that are a little bit more processed you always have to watch the salt and sugar content because to make that chip a little bit cheaper we can put a lot more salt and flavor and add more to it, maybe put a little bit less in the bag, use cheaper ingredients like salt and sugar, and it tastes just as good, but we can make it a little bit cheaper than Lay's can make their chips. So when you're comparing store to name brand there, usually the salt and sugar may change on those products, more packaged products. Other questions? Good question though. Okay, let's dive into produce here. This is really that first and foremost, when you walk into the store, this is what we often see. Um, but let's think about this. So are dried and canned fruits bad for you? What do you think about that statement there? True or false? False. Okay, so she said, you know, they put a lot of sugar in these, maybe if you did your own. So let's look at this. So it is false, they're not bad for you, they're good options, but we wanna know why, what to choose best here. Um, so when we look at these, um, a lot of our canned products, so tomatoes in particular, most people aren't aware that the lycopene, which is an antioxidant found in tomatoes, only gets higher and is exhibited in properties that we can are beneficial for us in canned tomatoes. It's not in a fresh tomato. So your canned pasta sauce, your canned sauces are great to choose and they shouldn't, you shouldn't feel guilty about making those choices. Um, with our dried fruits, great for the consumers who maybe need to gain a little bit of weight, who maybe are on the go and don't have a refrigerator, who maybe, you know, go, 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 and need something in their car, simple and easy, or just don't go to the store very often. These are all excellent for that. Um, and frozen fruit and vegetable are just as healthy as fresh. And we're going to talk a little bit about that too, um, because most consumers feel like if they're buying frozen or canned, they're not very healthy and they can be just as healthy. Um, but I want to touch on your point here too shortly about how, what should we choose in those sections? Um, so vegetables, if we're buying the canned, I would encourage the no salt added, or you can even rinse them yourself. So um, black beans, for example, I buy those canned often because I'm not one to soak beans and try to cook them and make them taste as good. So um, wh when I am buying them, I just buy the regular ones and then rinse and drain them and you're gonna rinse some of that sodium off if you're concerned about it. Sodium was a big buzzword about a year or so ago. We're seeing it being a little less, but it's still around in the media. 
Um, we need salt in our diet, so don't be afraid of salt. We just often consume a lot of it in fast food, packaged foods, processed foods, more than what we should be. So if you're cooking a lot at home, if you're not eating out that often and you're buying a can of vegetables, you're probably just fine. Um, but always look at that percentage of sodium on the back. If it's around 20%, we know that it's high in that and we wanna be careful, okay? Um, frozen and fresh, perfectly fine to choose. I often encourage buying frozen fruit and vegetable for a lot of my patients. One, it's a little bit cheaper. Two, it's gonna stay shelf stable a lot longer. We're not throwing things away that maybe we had good intentions of cooking, but we never got around to it. And three, it's often um, frozen at peak ripeness. So in the green bean field, they're gonna pick those pretty ripe and then they're gonna flash freeze them immediately. So a lot of nutrients are retained in that. As opposed to the fresh section, maybe they're picked about a week early and then they're ripening as they're through the trucking process to get here and then sit on the shelf for another few days. They do lose some nutrients that way. So your frozen is just as healthy as your fresh here. So don't be ashamed or feel bad about that, okay? Um, when we're making a shopping list here, you can see the fresh or frozen vegetables, lower sodium canned vegetables are appropriate here. Um, I'm just gonna highlight these. These will all be in your slides and presentations that I will give to the Wellness Works team too. Um, so dark green ve vegetables, really the more variety, the better when you're getting fruits and vegetables in. It really helps with making, meeting our nutrition needs. Red and orange, starchy vegetables here, and then let's dive into fruits. So when we're looking at fruits, um, she mentioned the canned fruits. They can have a lot of sugars and we have to be careful with that. Um, one thing I would challenge you to think about, we look at a can of fruit and we're going, whoa, 30 grams of sugar, but there's no label on that orange or apple in the produce section. If we saw a label on that, we'd see every bit of 15 to 30 grams of sugar in there. But it's natural sugar, it's naturally occurring in that product, and it's good for us. Um, with our canned, so if you're concerned about the canned and then adding sugar, we want to look for 100% juice or in its own juice. That's really the better benefit for the canned products. That means it's just using the own juice it was in um, instead of the gel packed and the, the really um, thickly packed heavy syrups, that type of stuff for our canned. Um, really, when we can choose the whole piece of fruit, we're getting better nutrients than just the juice. Um, the juice is fine as long as it's 100% juice, that's fine to choose. But if you look at the labels, there's no fiber in that and we're not gonna feel as full there. So just something to keep in mind if you're juicing or do the, the juicing type items. Um, I'd rather you blend your fruit in a blender. So take the whole fruit, put it in the blender and have that as your juice, as opposed to juicing it and leaving the fiber and the peel and the skin left to where we have very, lots of nutrition, but um, less fiber, okay? Um, with our dried fruits, so dried fruits can have sugar added to them as well. Here's where you, being a good label reader is important. So in the ingredient list, if it says sugar, like cranberries, for example, have sugar added to them. Raisins do not. Look at the ingredient list and you're going to see that. Um, so just really keeping that in mind as the front of the package is important, but the back and the ingredient list is also just as key. Okay. All right, let's dive into meat, beans, and nuts. Anyone have any questions in particular on produce so far? All right, um, so when, we look, when we're looking at proteins in this type of thing, um, I always say choose lean protein, and I get a lot of like, well, what does that mean, and how do I know what lean is? Um, lean is really just the fat content, but not all products, like our produce, is labeled specifically with fat content. If we look at a steak, it doesn't say how much lean it is or how much fat it is. We have to really know what to choose here. Um, so when we're choosing our proteins, I always encourage plant-based proteins as part of this. So eggs, beans, nuts, seeds, all great choices to choose. Um, when we're looking at beef and pork, those things that don't have a real label, it's not ground beef that has a label that says how much fat and how much lean. Anything with loin in the name is a great choice because it usually means leaner and round the name round would also mean leaner. So those are all great choices to choose. Anything 90% lean on our hamburger meat or pork or chicken or turkey means leaner as well. So when we see that on the nutrition facts panel or on the outside of ground beef, that's something to consider. And then our soy products would also be included in a great source of protein here. 
okay? Um, with the poultry, so poultry is always a great source of protein. It's more economical as well, but this is something that I would say taking the skin off to remove some of that excess fat and that excess calories would be great um, using the, the leaner turkey as well. Um, fish is also excellent here too. So when we think about fish, some, most people don't use it or often because they're afraid of cooking it or they don't know how to cook it or they just didn't grow up eating it. So this is something I would encourage you to try to include as well. Your frozen here is just as fine as the fresh. Um, we don't live right on the coast to where we're getting salmon right from the Gulf of Mexico. Um, it's usually being flown in. So buying frozen here is great as well. Yes, question? Um, what is the good percentage of ground hamburger meat? Yes, so percentage of ground hamburger meat, I would always choose 90% lean or higher. Um, if we want to dive into the budget piece of this, a lot of people will say, well, the 80% um, lean to 20% protein is cheaper. And my challenge back there would be, okay, that's great. But if you're draining that fat off and throwing it away or not using it, we're not getting as much meat either for that value. So 90% lean is a pretty good choice. 90-10 um, gives a little bit of that fat texture and flavor, but without all the, the excess calories. Okay, good question there. Yes. Yeah, good question. So um, the question was about the frozen bags of tilapia in particular, and we can just touch on tilapia in general um, or fish in particular. So that was one of my questions a lot of times when I was at um, HEB shopping, and I do a lot of partnership with the cooking connection there. And I asked them that same question. So when we're buying this fish, how do I know, you know, they're getting it from reputable sources? Because we see a lot of that. You see images of where they're being grown and how they're being raised. Um, and so I do know, I don't know about every grocer, but I, when I did ask HEB, since that's where I do most of the tours, um, they have a very stringent list of where they get them from, check them regularly, have to go visit the site, and it's a big check-in process. So I always feel comfortable there buying. Everywhere else, I don't know their processes. I'm sure they have something in place for that, but it's also um, at your own discretion there. So your frozen bags are fine of the tilapia. Yes, we see different things about raising them, what whatnot, um, but all of these products do have a code or standard on them that has to meet a certain requirement to be sold in stores. Um, each store is very different on that, but like I said, I can speak for HEB. I can't speak for everything else there. Okay, yes. Will you cover dark versus white chicken meat? Yeah, um, let me see. Okay, it's not on here, but let's, let's talk about that. So dark versus white chicken meat. Um, I talk a lot about this around Thanksgiving because a lot of patients are asking, well, I don't really like the white meat. Can I eat the turkey leg or thigh? Yes. So um, when we look at the differences here, it's a very big myth that our white meat is just so much better for us than our dark meat. And we're talking about poultry, right? Or did they specify? Okay. Okay. So um, when we look at the two, if you think about and just think anatomy here of when the bird flies, what areas of the body are they using the most? Wings. What else? the legs, the thighs, that area, okay? So it needs a lot of blood flow to go there. So that's why it's a little bit darker. And there's usually a lot more iron in blood. So those cuts of meat, the darker meats, the wings, the, the legs, the thighs have a little bit more iron in them, which helps with red blood cell count and also helps a little bit with tiredness, fatigue, anemia, if you've heard those terms before. Um, our white meat is usually seen as a little bit leaner they're both fairly lean. There's a little bit more fat to those areas because it needs more energy to fly. The breast meat just sits there so it doesn't need as much and that's why it's more muscular and not as much iron source there, okay? So just thinking of a good visual with that. Both are fine to choose. It's a personal preference. Your white meat usually is a little bit leaner than the dark, but they, the dark does have a little bit better benefit of the iron, okay? All right. Um, so when we're making a shopping list for protein, you're going to see these two. Like I said, this is all going to be in your handout of what types of items you would want to choose and then foods to limit for our protein rich foods. Okay, um, soy products. I'm just going to briefly touch on these two just to know that these would be included in that protein rich source. 
Um, seafood, two meals per week. I mentioned the frozen bags are great and our omega-3 rich foods or fish here are really gonna be our salmon and our um, tuna is gonna have a little bit of that too. Our tilapia catfish doesn't have very much of our omega-3, still a great source of protein, but we're not getting that full benefit of the omegas there. Okay, um, beans and peas, these are very great for a budget-friendly type um, diet or those just quick and easy on the go. We could add beans and rice to something. We could add it in a quesadilla. We could add it to meatless meals. Very cost effective and, a, and an excellent source of protein too that often gets overlooked in the grocery store. Um, nuts and seeds. So this is another area of protein. It is also a healthy fat and we're gonna go through some fat sources um, at, towards the end of the presentation. But a lot of questions that I get from consumers in this area are, well, which nuts are the best to choose? Um, and I'll say every nut has a different property. So our um, peanuts in particular are a little bit more budget friendly, great source of protein. We love, most people love peanut butter. It's easy, it's cheap, and it's economical. Um, our almonds have a little bit more calcium than any other nut. So if we're not milk drinkers, if we have um, low bone density, great source to be including there. Our walnuts are a great source of omega-3. So if you just saw the fish slide and you're like, yeah, that's great, Megan, but I'm not a big fish eater, our walnuts have a great source of omega-3 fatty acids in them, so incorporating those. Um, our pistachios are known as the skinny nut because we can eat 49 of them for one serving, but our almonds are only 23 per serving. So we can eat a little bit more of them, feel a little bit more full, and have the same amount of calories. So they all provide great benefits and great properties. Choose what you like or add different variety to that, okay? All excellent to be including in a diet, okay? Um, as we kind of round out protein here, what do you think? Eggs should be included as part of a healthy diet. Yes. What have we heard about eggs for a long time? Yes, so what are you thinking about that now? Negative. So let's go through this and we'll talk about it. Yes, eggs are a great source of a healthy diet. I have a lot of patients and consumers asking this question over and over. Um, think about the calories per egg. That's not that many, 70 calories per egg. Great source of protein. There's a lot of benefit in the yolk. Vitamin D included, choline, um, a lot of nutrients in that yolk that if we continue to throw that out, we're really doing ourselves a disservice by not giving ourselves that nutrition, okay? Um, with the color of the egg, what do you think about the color? So does it matter brown or white or what do you think? It's the color of the hen. Yeah, so it's the breed of the hen that lays the egg. And um, I'm going to tell this story because I, now it seems maybe a little bit more comical to most people, but at the time I was doing the tour, this was several years ago, and I asked the students the same question. What, what, what eggs are you buying? Tell me a little bit about this. Um, brown versus white. And they all said, well, brown eggs. You know, we see it in magazines and on TV. It's better for us. And I said, well, what's the difference? And they said, well, one's washed and one's not. <laughs> and, you know, for them, that was exactly what they thought. And for some of you here kind of giggling, it's like, well, that seems kind of crazy. But when we see it in the media, when we're constantly in, infused with eat brown eggs, these look prettier, these look better, we, we lose track of why we're buying what we're buying. And as I said at the beginning, really think about why we're buying what we're buying and be a smart consumer. So yes, there's no difference in that. And the yolk is just as beneficial from the brown egg as it is the white egg. Um, I will say the you may see like Eglin's Best or those type that have omega-3s in them. That's really the diet that the hen has been given. So yes, there is gonna be a little bit more omega-3s in the egg and that type of thing. Um, they are more expensive though. So budget-wise, I would say stick to your regular eggs for the nutrition benefit. Unless you just wanna buy the premium, go for it. You are gonna get a little bit better benefit. How about the color of the yolk? The certain brand has the mm -hmm. color, mm -hmm. more orange. Yep. Is that better? So the question was the color of the yolk. Is one, one's a little bit more orangey, darkish. It's really the diet of the hen. You'll usually find that darker color sometimes in yard um, birds if you're buying them from different people and not in the store. It's just the diet. So they may have been given more corn or more um, eating grass and bird bugs and that type of thing versus a standard diet from a producer. Does it matter? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It's just going to be, a, it's kind of like the grass fed versus grain fed beef. What's better? 
Um, the nutritional differences that you get from that yolk or from that beef is so minor, it's really a taste preference for most people. Okay, good question though. All right, um, red meats, I'm, I've already touched on this as well. Um, we're gonna compare red meat versus turkey, ground beef versus turkey here in a second. I'm gonna, gonna show you um, some differences here. Um, poultry, if you're looking for cheaper, the whole pieces are a lot cheaper than the individual and you can process that yourself. Um, but still poultry is gonna usually be one of the more economical sources of protein. Um, it's one of the more universal choices from among the patients that I work with too. But let's take a look at this. Before we go to ground beef versus ground turkey, tell me your thoughts on what's better, ground beef or ground turkey? Ground beef. Ground beef, why? I don't like the flavor of the ground turkey. Okay. <laughs> flavor, yes. So flavor drives why we choose what we choose. I think that's a great point to bring up. Um, how many of you think turkey's better? Okay, and why? I feel like I've just heard that in the media. We hear it in the media a lot, ground turkey, choose a ground turkey. And I'll tell you on a lot of my tours, that's 90% of what I get from the students is ground turkey is better. But here again, look at the label and know why we're buying what we're buying. So I'm comparing ground beef to ground turkey. For those of you who, who may not be able to see, we have 170 calories per um, serving in each. This is all a four ounce serving. Um, our total fat grams is eight grams in the beef and eight grams in the turkey. Um, our protein grams here, let's see, 23 grams in the beef and 21 in the turkey. Very, very comparable. And the reason why is I chose 93% lean ground beef and 93% lean ground turkey. We have choices in the market and there's 80% lean turkey now. There's 70% lean beef now. So if we're comparing them side by side, they're both almost identical, but the one difference we see, and I brought this up a little bit with the, the turkey legs versus the breast meat, is our iron content. So our iron in beef is 15%. Remember I said anything around 20 is pretty high. And in our turkey, it's 6%. So any of our red meats, we're getting about double the amount of iron. So don't be afraid to buy beef. It's a very common misconception of it's not healthy, it's not good for me, but if we're buying a lean choice, anything with loin in the name, anything with round in the name, anything 90% lean or higher, we're getting a good nutrition benefit from that, okay? You know, I should stay away from red meat. So much. Right. We hear that a lot of stay away from red meat. Don't choose it or only eat it once per week. If we're choosing lean choices, it's perfectly fine to choose. But what happens is we often see it in hamburgers that we're not cooking and it's usually 80% or lower or higher fat meat, or it's in steaks at a restaurant that's not lean, slathered with butter. Those are the types of things that often give it that bad reputation. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, milk, cheese, and yogurt. So let's go through this um, a little bit. So when we're looking at different milks, um, the, the recommendation here that I have is we have, let's start first start with cow's milk and then we'll dive into some other ones. So with our cow's milk, we have whole, 2%, 1%, and skim, okay? Across the board, they all have the same nutrients. So they all have vitamin D. It's very misleading. A lot of my consumers will say, well, I buy whole milk because it has vitamin D. They all have vitamin D. It's just marketed a little bit different. The, the whole milk will always say vitamin D milk. And a lot of my patients will say, I drink vitamin D milk. And I'll say, well, is it 2% whole? Well, it's vitamin D milk. And that's only usually listed on the whole milk, but it's in every one of those. The only difference that we see is the fat content. Protein is the same, fat's just different. And what a lot of people don't know is whole milk is only 4% milk fat. It's not 100% milk fat. So we go from 4% to two to one to zero, okay? Go with what tastes good to you. There's a lot of new research about whole milk being better for us and full fat dairy. So go with what you feel comfortable with. Just know that we're getting more fat, more saturated fat because it's coming from an animal which has been linked to some heart disease and health issues, weight management, that type of thing. Okay, so I always recommend a two or one percent milk as a good middle of the road. Still tastes pretty good, but we're getting some flavor and not the full fat variety. Okay, 
any kids under two, the recommendation is whole milk for brain development and growth, though. Was there a question, Christina? Oh, no, it was me. I okay. was wondering about the fat content. Okay, yes, so that's the difference there. Um, what I do want to bring up here with just milk, cow's milk versus other types of milk, so um, almond milk, hemp milk, coconut milk, rice milk, all of those will be touted as lower calorie, 60 calories per cup, 70 calories per cup. The reason for that, it has about one gram of protein per serving. Cow's milk has about eight or nine grams of protein per serving. So we're missing on the protein content. If you don't want to choose cow's milk for personal reasons or taste or lactose or just an allergy, soy milk is a very comparable product to cow's as far as all the nutrients and the protein content. But our, our milk alternatives have really grown and people are buying them without realizing what it is. But if you like the flavor and taste, go for it. Just know that it doesn't have the amount of protein as cow's milk does. Okay, questions on that? All right, I know I'm going quickly, but I want to save time for questions. Um, so with our margarine, margarine also used to get a bad reputation um, because it had a lot of trans fats in it. That's not always the case anymore, but when we are choosing margarine, we want that first ingredient to say liquid vegetable oil, and there should be no trans fats on that label. So you'll see total fats, and then you'll see trans fats. It should say zero, not a number there, if we're choosing margarine. I like to recommend using butter. It's basically, it's coming from that top layer of the milk that we didn't use, that fat content. There's very little added to it. Um, we, we've been using it for years and years, and so yes, it has fat, yes, it has saturated fat, but if we use it sparingly, it's appropriate to use. If you have heart disease risk in your family, I would encourage more of the liquid vegetable oils, either olive oil, canola oil, those types, or the tub spreads. Um, they have a lot of great varieties of those. As long as there's no trans fat in those, you're gonna see a much better unsaturated fat to saturated fat profile meaning the unsaturated fat is the healthier fat to choose. Do you have a question? No. Okay. okay, yes. Um, yogurts, so and cheeses are very similar to our milks. So cheeses made with 2% milk still melt well, have a good flavor, texture. Fat-free cheeses don't melt very well. They don't taste very good. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, just using the 2% milk cheeses are gonna be a good variety for you. Full fat cheese is fine as well. There's a lot of calcium and protein in cheese too, so it has a good profile. Um, yogurts, what we wanna look for here are the live and active cultures. Most all of our yogurts do. Activia used to tout itself as being the only one. They all do, it's just a marketing scheme for Activia to say we have all these live and active cultures. If you look on the very back of the ingredient list, in the very end of every yogurt label, it will say contains, and you'll know what cultures they are because they're very hard to pronounce and they look very scientific. Um, so that's what you would wanna look for there. Um, our Greek yogurts have a lot more protein than our regular yogurts do, but I do wanna bring up most of our Greek yogurts, and I say most because there's one or two brands I know of that, that do, but most of our Greek yogurts do not have vitamin D in them. I don't know why. I've asked a lot of questions about this too. Um, I do, I'm um, on the I'm amb ambassador for, health and wellness ambassador for Dairy Max, which is the local dairy council and they support dairy farmers. And um, I've asked these questions to them and they haven't really, no one can ever figure out why. And I think it's the straining process. When we strain Greek yogurt, it makes it really thick it loses some of that vitamin D from the milk. But just know if you're eating regular yogurt and you don't like the Greek yogurt, yay, because you're getting some vitamin D. If you love Greek yogurt, know that we need to get some vitamin D from other sources too, okay? Questions on that? All right, um, so when we're making a shopping list for dairy, you can see here our lower fat cheeses, yogurts, cottage cheese um, milks. And then those that we wanna to try to limit are our heavy creams, whole milks, that type of thing, unless there's a true need for that or unless you just like the flavor of that. Like I said, there's a lot of research coming out with whole milk being beneficial from the fat content. I, you'll, you, you'll start to see it now in yogurts too. It used to be all fat free, low fat. Now we're seeing full fat yogurts and a lot of people are buying them. It fills you up a little bit more, it feels better. Um, the fat content in there helps with brain development and function. 
So I think we'll see more of that, but there'll be need to be more research to come in that area. Okay. Um, lastly, let's talk through fats and then we'll, we'll go quickly through the, the end here. What do you think about this? Low fat items are healthier than regular fat. False. Why false? Because your brain needs a lot of fat to function properly. Okay. But regardless of our brain function, why do you think that the items would be um, not healthier? Okay, she said fat gives you flavor and fat can, and flavor can be added by salt and sugar. You're exactly right. So let's look at this here. Um, let's compare our regular peanut butter to our reduced fat peanut butter. So I'm going to back up here just to help with the confusion. We just talked about dairy and you're saying, Megan, you told me the lower fat varieties here are okay to choose. And now you're telling me, I don't know about this. So when we chose the low fat and dairy, remember that comes from an animal, it's saturated fat. I think of saturated as being a solid at room temperature so that butter doesn't just melt at room temperature, it stays pretty consistent. Unsaturated fat is liquidy at room temperature. Olive oil is pretty pourable at room temperature. So our saturated fat is more solid. When we take that away, we get a little bit of a health benefit of what we, the latest research is showing in that regard. When we have items that are reduced fat outside of dairy, so in the dairy section, going with a 2% or 1% milk is, is usually very appropriate. When we're outside of that section, so packaged products, peanut butter, um, salad dressings, when we're in these sections, I want you to first put on your thinking area and cap and think, what type of fat is in peanut butter? Is it healthy or unhealthy? Healthy, right? It's unsaturated. It's a nut. It's a seed. Um, those are all great fats for us. What type of fat is in salad dressing? Say a, a, a vinaigrette. Healthy. It's olive oil or canola oil. Healthy fat. So when we take that fat away, she said it exactly, they usually replace it with salt and sugar for flavor at the expense of a healthy fat. So be mindful if it's not in the dairy section and you're buying low fat, look at the label. If there's, if there's less unsaturated fat in there at the expense of more salt and sugar, which you see here, there's a, an extra gram of sugar in this reduced fat. There's, there's an extra 60 milligrams of sodium in this reduced fat. It still tastes the same, but we're taking the fat content down. But look what type of fat we remove. So it was total 16, total 12. We now have three and a half of grams of saturated and two and a half grams of saturated. The majority that they removed was the healthy unsaturated fat. So try to be a good consumer in this regard. Just because it says reduced fat does not mean healthier. Okay? Questions or confusion there? Okay. Um, we talked about omega-3s. This is just really a list of some of those other healthy omega-3s if you're not a big fish eater and you want to include more of that in your diet, which is always excellent to be doing. Um, a shopping list for fats, like I said, this is going to be in your presentation as well. And this breaks down what I was trying to explain, the saturated, unsaturated, and gives you a little bit more of a list of what that would be. Um, when we're looking at drinks, so we could spend a whole presentation on drinks and talking about artificially sweetened products and not. Um, if you're just looking across the board at weight management and calories, getting your diet soda, low, low sugar beverages are going to be the be best way to go from a calorie perspective. From a health perspective, the verdict is still out. What are these sweeteners doing to us long term? There's a lot of research right now, too, on just the satiation. Do we feel full? when we have a diet soda or do we crave sweets in other forms because we had that diet soda, um, that's what we're seeing more of right now. My perspective here is have the real thing, just have a small portion of it. You're gonna feel better and fuller with it. You're gonna feel more mentally satisfied and chances are you're not just gonna keep drinking five sodas a day because of that it's low calorie or sugar free, okay? Um, when we're in the frozen section too, this is really just a go-to list of how to build that grocery list. Um, frozen fruits and vegetables, like I said here, are excellent to be combining. Um, our breakfast foods, here we would look for less than about 350 calories. Frozen dinners are fine options, to, especially if you're 
living alone, single, need something simple, need something to take to work, that I always tell my patients, if I just had a lean cuisine, I'd probably be hungry in an hour. So add something to it. Fruits, vegetables, that type of thing are all perfect to be adding here. Um, so that's all excellent choices if you're thinking in this regard. Um, when we're looking at snacks, um, generic versus name brand, I kind of already brought this point up. That was answered again. Um, when I like to look at snacks as a combination of a protein and carbohydrate, our snacks often just become chips, cookies, crackers, things that we think of being snacky foods, but try to combine some protein with that cracker. So maybe it's a whole grain Triscuit or wheat thin, which are 100% whole grain, yay, and cheese to be that protein source. Maybe it's our regular peanut butter, not reduced fat with an apple, protein, carbohydrate. So we have that sense of pairing, which helps us feel fuller longer. Um, so, and pretzels, you could have pretzels with peanut butter, pretzels with hummus. Those are all fine snacks to combine, but we're not just having that carbohydrate there. Okay. Um, lastly, before we open it up for some questions, these are just some helpful apps. Um, for those of you, I know in College Station there are choices as far as where we shop and, and what we choose, um, but if you've never used the HEB app, I would highly encourage you to do that. Um, I use it on a regular basis. I don't, and let me just say this, I don't work for HEB. They don't give me any money for this. I actually don't live in College Station. The only store we have in our town is HEB, so I have no choice. Um, so just disclaimer there. With the app, there are digital coupons though. I will say um, last month they had a lot on there of, you know, if you spend $30 in the meat section, you get $5 off. If you spend $10 in produce, you get $2 off. That's not every month, but they do occasionally. I say $37 at the store uh, when my bill with two kids is over $200 regularly. It was like, wow, this is great. Um, but they do pretty good coupons as well, not just on your items that maybe you would think of, well, I don't buy a lot of packaged foods. I buy more produce and meats and that type of thing, deli. Um, they do a lot of coupons there. So that's a great thing to use. Um, Grocery Pal and Meal Lime is great as well. So if you're looking for different options for apps or ways to organize your list or ways to save a little bit of money, um, these are all very easy. And I'll tell you, my mom, um, who is also, I was telling her about the ATV app and she's not real digitally, digit digital savvy, especially on the phone, um, I got her to use it and she saved $25 at HEB as well by buying some of those same items. Um, so if she can use it. I say anyone in this room can use it. As long as you have it on your phone, you, they scan it for you. Um, it's really pretty simple. So um, check it out if you're looking at some ways to save a little bit of money and be efficient there. Okay, um, here are some references, but I do want to open it up for questions. Yes. I was just going to say another thing I, that's nice on the AGB app. I guess it's that same app they were talking about. It tells you in your store what aisle a particular Yes, on. yes. She mentioned the AGB app being, um, it'll tell you what aisle it's on. And I've used that regularly. I'm going, I know this is in this store. Um, as long as you have your store listed as your location on that app, um, you can type in, hey, I'm looking for raisins, and it will tell you aisle 20, and you can go right there and find it. Um, it's really great for that type of stuff. I've used it at other stores as well, um, not grocers, but it's really handy when you're, when you're desperately searching for something and no one's in sight to be found to ask. So, okay, other questions or comments? Yes. Um, I was wondering if you can talk a little bit, I don't know if today's topic the question I had when I go to the grocery store okay. sometimes is about um, like supplements mm -hmm. and like if you know you're not getting something in your diet mm -hmm. for particular reason, um, is Excellent. it better to just go get the pill supplement? Excellent question. Stuff? Yes. So the question was, what about supplements? We're going to talk a little bit about that in the sports nutrition presentation, but I'll highlight it now for sure. Um, so when we think about supplements, um, remember with the food label, we started with that, that's regulated by the government and it can, it's a certain percentage of error that they allow on that. With our supplements, there is no real regulatory body for them. So just know that going into it, it's a, it's a pretty good money making business for them. And there's no real tight regulation on you have to list everything that's in there or not in there. Um, but when we look at supplements, I would always suggest food first, first and foremost, if we can. 
but that's not always the case for most people. Whether we're deficient in it naturally, whether we just have a restricted diet for some reason, so if we're deficient in something, it's always important to get it, um, and the supplement would be appropriate to do that. A general multivitamin for most people is sufficient for that. Personally, I take one daily and don't think anything about that because I can't eat 20 oranges a day to get my vitamin C. So that's important. Um, if you have heart disease risk or maybe some elevated cholesterol, we know that it's not always just from food anymore. So fish oil is effective with that. Um, for most people or um, females postmenopausal, we find a lot of vitamin D deficiencies and calcium deficiencies. So that would be an important supplement to take if we're deficient. But talk to your doctor first, do some lab work, see if we're truly deficient before we start spending money on this. Because we do excrete a lot of these supplements in our urine. So it's expensive to buy that when our body's going to excrete the amount that we don't use. So um, think about that just from an overall cost savings benefit. But we get a lot more from, new, from the food than we do the actual supplement. And we'll talk more about protein powders and all that in the, in the sports one if you have specific questions there too. Okay, one more question. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. I had a question about eggs. Yes. Uh, so are cage-free eggs better than the regular white ones we get at HEB? Good question. So are cage-free eggs better than the regular standard eggs? Um, so what does that mean? It just means cage-free as far as where that chicken was raised and how it was raised. Um, we, could, we could look up a lot of standards here and I could give you a whole lot of information. My husband's in the poultry industry, so sometimes I get way too much information here. But it really also, there's a standard of it's out of the cage for a certain time period. So it may, it still lives in a cage for the most part, but there for a certain time period, it's not in that cage. It's really more of just a feel good, pull at your heartstrings, this chicken wasn't caged. Does that make you feel better? Great, okay, buy the eggs. But nutritionally, there's really no difference in that. So um, spending more money on it to think it's better for us nutritionally is really a marketing scheme. But here again, it's that feel good effect of, well, it was raised better or, and if that means a lot to you, great, go for it. But if nutritionally is more important and budget is more important, just your regular eggs are fine. I have a question on sugar. Uh -huh. um, for someone that is diabetic, uses artificial mm -hmm. sugar, how does that affect the body? Yes, so a diabetic using artificially sweetened products, so Splenda, Stevia, Truvia, that type of thing. Um, for diabetics, and I'll just use the for diabetics piece here, choosing the artificially sweetened products is what we need to, for them to choose. It doesn't raise the blood sugar, we know that. It helps with glycemic control, blood sugar control, very appropriate for those patients. But for someone who's just buying it just because, you may not need to do that. But for a diabetic, yes, I would always recommend a sugar-free syrup over regular syrup because of the glycemic control and index there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I have a question. Kind of, we, lately we see a lot of things naturally sweetened with honey. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of using honey as a, some sort of sugar or sweetener substitute, how does, what is the difference between using that and the sugar? Okay, so the difference between honey and sugar as a sweetened beverage or sweetener, <laughs> um, natural sweetener, how do we decipher that and what does that mean? I think this is an excellent question here again because um, Sugar is still sugar at the end of the day. So whether it's in maple syrup or honey or brown sugar or white sugar, it's still added sugar, okay? Where sugar to me is not added sugar is it's from fruit because it's naturally there or lactose, which is a milk sugar. So you're gonna see sugar in milk. It's not added to it, it's just naturally there. Um, so that is not added sugar. Right now, the government is in the process of putting that on the label. So we're gonna see carbohydrates, sugar, right under that you're gonna see added sugars. You may start to see that, some of that, and I'm seeing it now on some labels. And that's really gonna be that honey, agave nectar, syrup, high fructose corn syrup, that's all added sugar. And biologically, we could argue that, there, well, it's natural, it reacts a little bit differently, but it's still sugar. Okay, so my recommendation when I say don't have any more for some of my patients need to choose less sugar, it's all in there. So it's sugar, it's, art, it's um, honey, it's agave nectar, it's maple <laughs> syrup, it's real maple syrup, 
It's all of that there. So that still impacts our blood sugar. Now, another common thing I say a lot is judge the food by the company it keeps. So if we're adding a little bit of honey to plain Greek yogurt with some nuts, okay, there's a pretty good benefit there. If we're adding um, regular agave nectar, but it's pancakes loaded with jam, loaded with all these different things and chocolate chips, that's a little bit different perspective, okay? Um, you're gonna see a lot too of yogurts, for example, they may say no artificially sweetened products or no, no artificial sugar added. And, but it tastes sweet and there's very low sugar um, grams, but it has this flavor. Stevia and Truvia right now, by the government standards, can be labeled as no, not artificially sweetened. In my mind, they're artificial sweeteners, but they grow on a plant, so they're technically not man-made. They grow on a plant. So if you choose an artificial sweetener, I always suggest Stevia or Truvia because it's a little bit more natural, used that loosely, but it's government regulations allow I see it on like orange juice that's lower calorie and, and yogurts that's lower calorie that it says no artificial sweeteners used. It's low sugar. It's zero grams of sugar, but it tastes sweet and they're getting away with that. If you look at the ingredient list, you'll see Stevie or Truvia on there. Okay. And it doesn't, that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It's just what's going on right now. And um, you just have to be a good label reader to know what is it tastes sweet. They say there's no Splenda or Aspartame or Sweet and Low in here. Why is that? Well, Stevia and Truvia are, are the, kind of the new sweetener right now. Other questions, comments? I know we're... Okay, one more. Is there, what's the difference with grass-fed beef versus cow-fed? Yes, grass-fed versus grain-fed beef and the difference. Um, you could say, well, one, it's a diet. So one is grass and one is usually grain. Um, nutritionally, there's, and I've even asked this of the beef, Texas Beef Council, okay, tell me what should we be recommending? Some will say they can taste the flavor difference in it. I haven't really been able to taste much of a difference, but some people can. Um, and nutritionally, there's very, there's a little bit more omega-3s in the grass fed, but not significant. So nutritionally, it's about the same. It's just here again, a little bit more marketing. It helps you think, oh, well, they were given a green pasture to feed in. Um, but usually they're, they're all gonna be grain and grass fed at some point. Some are just grain finished. So at the end of their life, they're more grain. And then some are more grass fed throughout and then more at the end as well. So nutritionally, not a significant difference. It all goes back to taste preference and then just personal preference. Okay, I'm happy to say after and answer questions too. So I know you'll need to do the drawing here for them. All right. Thank you. You're Megan. welcome. Oh, we can certainly clap for her. <laughs> Thank you.